obtain DC persistent memories that offer up to half a terabyte of memory per DIMM and three terabytes of memory per CPU socket. So for the first time, we would have a byte addressable load store interface to storage that would be an order of magnitude faster than existing soft software interfaces to storage devices. This is what we envision our future persistent memory systems to look like. We would have a, a volatile DRAM and durable persistent memory being served by a similar load store interface from a memory controller. In this system, the components such as hardware caches and DRAM are volatile. So in case of failure, such as power failure, these components would lose their contents. On the other hand, persistent me memory being durable would retain its contents and this would allow the recovery to inspect data structures in persistent memory to restore system back to a consistent state. Several memory persistency models have been proposed in the past to provide guarantees required for writing recoverable software. These persistency models specifically define the program state that recovery would observe in case of failure. And these models provide two key primitives. First, they ensure failure atomicity for a group of updates, or what we call as persists, to the memory. And second, they govern ordering constraints on operations to the memory. These are the contributions of our work. First, we propose a language level persistency model using synchronization free regions. Specifically, we define using our persistency model precise state of program post failure. And we do this by employing existing synchronization primitives in C++. We also provide semantics as a part of language implementation. That is, we provide a compiler pass that can transparently emit logging code for the persistent accesses within a program. We build our persistency model in two implementations, coupled SFR and decoupled SFR. And these two implementations differ in the simplicity and performance that they enable. And finally, we show that our implementations can achieve 65% better performance than state-of-the-art mechanism. This is the outline of my talk. First, I'll talk briefly about the design space of existing language-level persistency models and what guarantees that they enable. Second, I'll talk about our proposal, which is persistency for synchronization-free regions and the two implementations that we use to build our persistency model. And finally, I'll end my talk with the performance evaluation of our implementations. Language level persistency models enable writing portable recoverable software. They extend memory model of a language with certain persistency semantics. And these persistency semantics offer two guarantees. First is failure atomicity. That is, which group of updates should be visible in the memory atomically with respect to failure? And second, what are the ordering constraints? Or how can programmers order operations to the memory? Uh, to the memory? Let's look at each of, these, uh, each of these guarantees in detail. First, why do we need failure atomicity? Uh, and uh, what guarantees do, uh, does it enable? Uh, on your right, I'm showing you an example of a linked list and an operation to add a new node to this linked list. This operation involves two steps. First, filling a new node or adding a new node. And second, updating a tail pointer to, to, to point to this new node. These two steps need to happen in this very specific order. This is because if, uh, if we update the tail pointer first, and if there is a subsequent failure, this tail pointer would be pointing to a garbage node. Programmers have to be cognizant of this possibility and have to annotate a fence operation in between to order the two steps. And this burden falls on a programmer. Programmers have to ensure, or they have to know all the points in the program which require ordering constraints and have to uh, annotate fence operations appropriately in the program. As an alternative, we can make these two steps atomic or failure atomic. That is, in case of failure, either a new node is added to this linked list or linked list uh, retains its original form. Thus, failure atomicity makes persistent memory programming easier. Specifically, failure atomicity assures that either all or none of the updates are visible to recovery in uh, post failure. And it is guaranteed either by hardware, library, or language implementations. The language level persistency models that have been proposed until now provide different granularities of this failure atomicity. Specifically, this can be classified into two, uh, two sets. 
The first set of mechanisms provide failure atomicity for individual updates or individual persists. And next class of mechanisms uh, provide failure atomicity for outermost critical sections in a program. However, both these, uh, these sets of mechanisms suffer from uh, one uh, critical trade-off. Either these mechanisms provide a good runtime uh, performance, but uh, compromising uh, uh, on the semantics that they offer to recovery, or they suffer from a high performance overhead while uh, providing precise semantics to recovery. Let's look at first set of mechanisms uh, here. On the left, I'm showing an example code consisting of nested uh, critical sections. The outermost critical section is bounded by lock and unlock to L1. The inner critical section is bounded by lock and unlock to L2. And then we perform few updates in between. This first set of persistency model provide failure atomicity for individual updates. And they mostly rely on the guarantees uh, from the hardware ISA. However, these mechanisms suffer from one critical drawback. That is, in case of failure, the partial updates might be visible to recovery. Consider a scenario uh, where a compiler or hardware reorders a bunch of memory operations within a critical sections that are perfectly legal in a fault-free execution of a program. However, if there is any intermediate failure, these reorderings are exposed to recovery. In other words, recovery might see the non-sequentially consistent state of a program which would never happen in a fault-free execution. Programmers have to be aware of these, uh, of these scenarios and have to build custom additional logging mechanisms to build a higher, failure, a higher granularity of failure atomicity. The next set of mechanisms solves this, solves this problem by providing failure atomicity for outermost critical sections. These mechanisms are appealing because uh, they, uh, they guarantee that rec recovery never observes non-sequentially consistent state of a program. However, these mechanisms suffer from two critical drawbacks. First, they have a high performance overhead. And this is because they require complex dependency tracking between logs across different threads. And because of which, they suffer from uh, uh, with higher than 2x performance cost. However, more importantly, these mechanisms do not generalize to certain uh, synchronization primitives in the language. For instance, some mechanisms do not uh, support condition variables. So as an alternative, we propose persistency for synchronization-free regions. Synchronization-free regions, or SFRs, are regions of code delimited by synchronization operations or system calls. Here in this example, synchronization operations are acquire and release, so there are two SFRs in this example. SFRs have been widely used in the past to define data registry memory models and to provide sequentially consistent semantics to parallel programs. In this work, we use failure atomic SFRs to define precise post-failure program state while at the same time maintaining low performance overhead. Let's look at what guarantees does our persistency model enable. Here on the left, I'm showing you an example on a single thread where we perform an acquire and release operation on an at atomic variable. Within a thread, we ensure failure atomicity for updates within an SFR. That is, either all the updates within an SFR are visible or none of them are visible in case of failure to recovery. More importantly, we uh, define precise points within a thread where post-failure program state would be. This also allows us to enable certain hardware and compiler reorderings uh, between the memory operations within the SFR. Across the threads, we enable orderings using synchronizing acquire and release operations. Consider a similar code on thread two, uh, but acquire on thread two synchronizes with the release operation on thread one. Using this uh, ordering, we ensure that all the updates within SFR one are ordered before updates within SFR two. In other words, we serialize these SFRs all the way up to the persistent memory. We build our persistency model in our two implementations, coupled SFR and decoupled SFR. But before I go into the specifics of each of these implementations, let me, uh, let me show you how we ensure fa uh, failure atomicity for updates within the SFR. We use undo logging mechanism for, uh, for the updates within SFR. Here, going back uh, to the same example from the previous slide, we perform an acquire and release on, at, on an atomic variable L1, and then there is an update in between. Thus, SFR consists of a single update. Potentially, it can have multiple updates. But for each of the updates, we perform an undo logging, which involves four steps. First, we create a log entry in the persistent memory. This log entry records the old value of the memory location that is being updated within the SFR. 
Once we create a log entry, we go ahead and perform an actual update or we muted data. Then we parse this data or we flush this data from the volatile caches all the way up to the persistent memory. Note that uh, this is a high latency operation because our program needs to stall until all the updates are flushed to the memory. And this brings a high memory latency, which is of the order of hundreds of nanoseconds in the critical execution path. Finally, once that is done, we go ahead and clear logs or commit the log entries. For SFR to be failure atomic, these four steps need to, be ha need to happen in this very specific order. And our compiler ensures that by annotating these steps with fence operations in between. Uh, we use undo logging mechanism uh, in both of our implementations. On the, uh, uh, on, on the left-hand side, I'm showing the similar example where an acquire on thread two synchronizes with a release operation on thread one. Uh, thus, we, uh, our implementation needs to order updates within SFR1 before updates within SFR2. And we also need to ensure that each of the SFRs is failure atomic. To do that, we, uh, we enable undo logging for each of the SFRs uh, uh, with the, uh, using the steps that I described in the previous slide. Also, we order these updates uh, using synchronizing acquire and release. Since we, uh, we perform all the four steps in undo logging, that is we create the logs, perform updates, and flush, uh, flush and clear the log entries uh, before uh, we end the SFR, we ensure that all the updates within SFR1 are persistent in memory before we perform any updates within SFR2. This coupled SFR allows for a simpler implementation. Persistent state is coupled with that of current execution, and it lags that of execution by at most one ongoing SFR. Thus, in case of failure, we are guaranteed to achieve the latest state of program uh, as it was before the failure. However, this comes at a performance cost. Recall that this uh, step P1, uh, where we flush updates to the persistent memory, is a high latency operation. And here, we perform that in a critical execution path, as a result of which coupled SFR suffers from a high performance cost. We saw that in our next implementation, which is decoupled SFR. The key idea behind de decoupled SFR is that we persist updates and we commit logs in the background out of the critical execution path. We still, uh, we still, perform, uh, we still create log entries and perform the updates uh, in the foreground during execution. To perform, uh, uh, to perform persist operations in the background, we launch a set of background threads that periodically inspect uncommitted logs, flush the updates within them, and then commit the, log, uh, commit the logs. We still need to commit these logs in the correct order. This is because in case of failure, we need to roll back the partial updates in the reverse order of creation of these logs. Thus, it requires us to record the order of log creation or the order in which SFRs were executed in the first place. Let me show, show you how we do that uh, during execution by walking you uh, step by step through the execution of this program. Before uh, going to that, uh, we, we maintain certain uh, metadata in the persistent memory to track the logs. We, uh, we maintain thread-specific headers. Since there are two uh, threads in this program, we maintain two thread headers. These headers mark the beginning of the logs for that thread. We also maintain uh, a sequence table in the volatile memory that maintains a map of, of an atomic variable in the program uh, with a counter or a sequence number. This counter is essentially a scalar clock that records partial order of execution of SFRs. So to begin with, first we execute x equal to 100 and create a corresponding log entry under, uh, in thread one header. This log entry uh, records the old value of x, which was 0. Next, we create a log entry for release operation. Uh, at every, uh, when we create a log entry for a synchronization operation, we record the latest value of sequence number from the table. Since sequence number for L1 is zero, we record that in its undo log entry. Also, at each release operation, we atomically increment uh, the sequence number in the table, so zero becomes one. Finally, when we execute a synchronizing acquire, we record this new value of sequence number from the table, followed by executing x equal to 200. Now, uh, now uh, as you can see, sequence numbers record the interthread uh, order of creation of the logs. And background threads can inspect these logs and commit the logs in the increasing order of these sequence numbers. 
Here in interest of time, I am showing you a very simple example consisting of single, single uh, acquire and release synchronizing pair. However, in reality, there can be multiple synchronizing uh, operations and uh, they, they can be racing. Uh, and we, do, uh, we deal with them and uh, I, uh, we explain how we deal with them in the paper. Also, we perform certain optimizations such as log coalescing and batch commits that we talk about in detail in the paper. Now, let me show you how our implementations perform as compared to state-of-the-art mechanisms. We build, our, uh, we build our implementations as compiler passes in LLVM 3.6.0. Our compiler pass instruments a store and synchronization operations to emit log entries. It also creates a log, sp log space in persistent memory to record uh, all these logs. And finally, it also launches a set of background threads uh, to flush and commit logs in the background uh, in the case of decoupled SFR. We use a set of write intensive micro benchmarks that have been widely used by the prior, uh, prior works. And these micro benchmarks uh, consist of 12 threads and perform 10 million operations. Finally, we perform our experiments on machines with 12 physical cores and two-way hyperthreading. This is the performance evaluation of our uh, implementation. On the x-axis, I am showing you uh, the list of micro benchmarks that we use for our st uh, study. On y-axis is the normalized execution time. So lower is better. This execution time is uh, normalized to ATLAS, which is uh, a state-of-the-art mechanism to, uh, that enables failure atomicity for outermost critical sections, as I defined in the prior slides. Uh, on the, on the rightmost side, I am also showing you uh, a design point uh, for no persistency, uh, which do not enable any uh, recovery guarantees uh, in case of failure. I am showing you this design point uh, because this is the lower bound on execution time that our implementations can enable. So as compared to uh, Atlas, we perform 65% better. And this is for two key reasons. Atlas needs to perform complex tracking of dependencies across logs between different threads uh, which uh, both our coupled SFR and decoupled SFR implementation, implementations do not need to perform. And this is because of the property of the serial, serializability of SFRs. Second, uh, both coupled SFR and decoupled SFR can perform distributed commit operations that Atlas cannot perform. However, in some cases, as you may have noticed, coupled SFR performs better than that of coupled, uh, decoupled SFR. And this is counterintuitive because uh, in coupled SFR, we flush updates in the critical execution path. In these benchmarks, they perform only fewer store operations per SFR, as a result of which the, uh, the overhead of creating logs and recording their order is much higher than what we can achieve by moving persist operations to the background. So to conclude, we propose a, failure, a persistency model that uh, provides failure atomicity for synchronization-free regions. In our persistency model, the persistent state moves from one synchronization operation to the next within a thread. And it allows us to extend clean, sequentially consistent semantics to post failure recovery code. We propose two implementations that build our persistency model. And finally, we show that our implementations can perform 65% better than Atlas. With that, I end my talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Plenty of time for questions, so the microphone will come to you if you raise your hand. All right, well, I've got one question to start us off. So would there be an opportunity here to further increase performance by using some static category of techniques to label a subset of the writes as not interacting with the persistent store, perhaps escape analysis or uh, some additional step? Uh, uh, definitely. So uh, there have been prior works that, uh, uh, that allow us to specifically annotate which are the persistent operations in the program, and we can perform log operations only for those accesses to perform other uh, uh, extra performance, uh, uh, to gain extra performance oppor opportunities there. The sure. numbers you presented here are for all rights in the entire C++ program, right? Uh, yeah, uh, but we also at the runtime check whether that uh, address is mapped to the persistent memory. Hi, uh, uh, Andrew Myers from Cornell. Um, so a word that you didn't say in this talk, but that I thought of was transaction. So I'm trying to understand how the guarantees that your SFRs uh, offer relate to uh, guarantees that uh, transactions would offer. 
uh, and of course there are many different possible transactional models, and, and, and also the implementation techniques uh, relate to the way that people implement transactions. Yeah, so that's a great question, and we talk about uh, that in detail in the paper. Uh, there have been several transaction uh, techniques that uh, allow for failure atomic transactions. However, transactions do not generalize to all the synchronization primitives, and uh, they suffer from, they are not widely used because of, you know, several, uh, uh, several cases because of transaction deadlocks and uh, so many things. So uh, uh, here what we enable is we use existing synchronization primitives in the language itself, and we extend that to provide uh, guarantees required for writing recoverable code. All right, so with that, yeah, let's... So there is, oh. So your performance charts don't um, indicate whether or in how many the rollbacks occurred? Were there any? Uh, so this is, uh, this performance graph shows uh, the execution, pro uh, execution of a program uh, in fault-free scenarios. So here we show that just to see what, what the overhead of the, uh, of the loggings would be uh, in the fault-free execution, because that is a common case. And we don't want to, uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the performance overhead of the common common case won't be uh, should be high. Um, okay, but you should probably at least cite one measure about how m much more extensive um, recovery is under your scheme, which yeah. looks substantial. Uh, yeah, so we uh, we talk about that in the in the paper. Uh, in most of our benchmarks, uh, the rollback time was uh, not not as high. It was less than, uh, I guess, uh, a second or two seconds. Uh, but uh, as compared to Atlas, since uh, this, uh, which is a state of the art mechanism, Atlas can perform commit operations uh, in a centralized fashion. So it took much more time as compared to uh, our schemes. All right, so with that, if there are no further questions, let's go ahead and thank our speaker again.